You don't know how I was blessed this morning when they sang. I had visited your church, my wife and I, all a few times. And one of those times that we were here, the couple that just sang, sang. And this morning, while I was getting ready to come to church, I just kind of whispered a prayer to the Lord and said, Lord, I hope that older couple sings this morning before I preach. Isn't that good? So you, you, you folks, you bless me. And I know you're a blessing to many here at Trinity Baptist Church. Well, it's an honor to be here. It's a joy. And we're glad you're here. If I was the only one here, it wouldn't be worth our coming. But you're here. So it is. The scriptures have been read this morning. But before I bring the message, I'd like to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I'd like to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we have gathered here this morning in this place for a purpose. Thank you for this place, this church, these folks. From the oldest to the youngest, we're grateful that each one are here. And Lord, we look on the outward appearance, but you look on the heart. You look deep within each one of us and know what our need is. And even though we may not look like it on the outside, on the inside, Lord, there may be those here who are going through tough times. Smiling on the outside, but frowning on the inside. I pray that you might lift them up today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd lift this whole church up today. We know that you have the power to do that. I pray that you would help this preacher today to bring the message that you've laid upon my heart to preach to these folks at Trinity Baptist Church on this Sunday morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What's your dream for your church? What is your dream for your church? That's what Psalm 126 is all about. You see, the children of Israel had been in captivity for a long, long time. They had been downtrodden. They had been unhappy. They had been abused. And they would dream of the day when they would be set free so they could go back to their beloved city, Jerusalem. They would cry out to God time and time again for the opportunity to be set free so they could go back and be what God wanted them to be in Jerusalem. And finally the day came when the king of Babylon allowed all those who wanted to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their city to return back there. And really that's what Psalm 126 is all about. You see the Lord finally, after so many prayers and so many hardships and pleading with God, the Lord allowed their dream to come true. And because of this, the Bible said in verse number 2, their mouths were filled with laughter. They had gone from sadness to laughter. They were happy. The Bible said their tongues were filled with singing. Have you ever noticed that when someone is happy, they like to hum or sing? That's the way they were. The Bible said their mouths were filled with singing. Verse 3 said they were praising God, and they said, The Lord hath done great things for us, and we are glad. Isn't it a great day in the life of a Christian or in the life of a church when God finally comes through and your dream comes true? That, that you've been praying for for a long time to happen. And maybe there are some here today who 
been praying for a long, long time for God to do something in your life, to make things better in your life, and you have a dream of what you want God to do in your life. What a wonderful day it is when God finally answers that prayer, and it's as though you're set free. And that dream becomes a reality rather than just a prayer. They had many hard days behind them. Many of them were filled with weeping. They had cried. They had many tears. But now God came through for them, and they are reaping in joy. They are rejoicing. The bad times are all behind them now, and the good times are before them. They are H-A-P-P-Y what? Happy. Happy. Isn't it a great thing to be happy? I wonder how many people today are happy. Not just sitting in this church, but all around this world. I mean, I know that we live in a day when there's a lot of people angry. All you got to do is get behind the wheel of your car and go down the road. And if that don't do it, go to Walmart. <laughs> the world's full of angry people. But I wonder today how many people are happy. Now I want to ask the leadership of this church and the members of this church two questions. And I don't know any of you. I've met a few of you. I know very little about your church. Very little. But I would like to ask the leadership of this church, and I don't even know who they are. And I don't know who's members sitting in these pews today and who are just visitors. But I want to ask you two questions. Number one, do you have a dream? Do you have a vision of what God can do here at Trinity Baptist Church? Have you ever thought about that? I believe God wants to do great things in every church. But God is limited to what he can do in a church by the obedience of the people. But do you have a dream? And then the second question is, what is that dream? What have you been asking God to do here in your church? All those prayer meetings, all those meetings around the table, and all the talk what has been discussed for the future of Trinity Baptist Church? What is your dream? What is your vision of what God can do here in this place? Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, no dream, the people perish. You see, churches all over our nation have perished. They've closed their doors. Many of them have sold their buildings either because they have no vision or they had a vision at one time and lost it. And I want to say this morning, whatever it took to make you successful thus far, you've got to keep doing it or you will no longer be successful. Just because you had a dream at one time doesn't mean you have a dream today. You need a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Multitudes of lost people are perishing because churches have no vision. They have no dream. Let me describe to you this morning the average church. The average church comes together on a Sunday morning or maybe a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. But they come together on a Sunday morning. They shake hands with one another. They welcome one another. They'll sing a few songs. They'll pray some few prayers. They'll make some announcements. They'll preach a sermon. They'll give an invitation. They'll have a benediction. And then all the people and all the pastors will go home and come back and do it the next Sunday. I've just described to you the average church. Very few people getting saved. Baptismal water is hardly ever being troubled. 
No excitement in their midst of what God can do in the church. And there's some wonderful things God can do in a church if the church will let God do it. You see, the church has become so organized, God can't do what he wants to do even if he wanted to do it because it don't fit our schedule. Hey, I'd rather be in God's schedule than man's schedule. But the average church is failing. I've always been a dreamer. Even before I was saved, I was a dreamer. Not so much of what God could do, but what I wanted to do. You see, I read my Bible not long after I was saved when I was 21 years old, where the Bible said nothing is impossible with God. Hey, I just believed that. I believed that just like I did the night I was saved when the Bible said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God kept that promise. He saved my soul. So when I read in the Bible that nothing is impossible with God, hey, I just believed it. And then I went on to read one day where the Bible said there's nothing. You say, what's that word nothing mean? It means nothing. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. And I believed it. Let me ask you this morning, do you believe that? Do you believe that there's nothing too hard for the Lord? I mean, we say we do, but when's the last time you saw God do something that only God can do? Not only in your life, but in the life of Trinity Baptist Church. When's the last time when you came to church And you really felt the presence of the Lord. And you were lifted up. And you saw people saved. The baptismal waters were troubled. And you knew that God was at work in your church. When is the last time? And you may have it every Sunday. I don't know. I don't go here. But I tell you something. It's available. It's available to every church. And again, if they will meet what God said a church ought to be. Listen, if you can dream it and believe it and God be for it, it can happen. But you've got to believe it. And you've got to dream it first. And again, do you have a dream for Trinity Baptist Church? Or are you satisfied with what you have? While the world outside of you, and I want to tell you something, the world outside of you is getting bigger every month. There are houses and apartments going up around this church and around this city where there are hundreds of thousands of people that needed to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no limit to what God can do here in this church. You see, every church and every house, every building, every business, every institution, it first lived in the heart of a person. They had to dream it and dream one day that it would come true before it could ever happen. The temple they built in Jerusalem was a magnificent building so beautiful people have said probably the most magnificent building that has ever been built on the face of this earth but before it could ever be built it had to first of all live in the heart of a man named Solomon whom God chose to build it I don't know how Trinity Baptist Church was started I don't even know the year it was started But I can tell you this much, before it ever started, it lived in the hearts of a group of people who had a dream, who wanted to see that dream realized. And there were probably prayer meetings and other kind of meetings, and people gave of their money, they gave of their time, and they begged God to let us start a church. And God allowed you to start that church. Why? Because you had a dream. 
And I want to tell you something. We sit in a building today where that dream was realized. But you shouldn't be just satisfied. You need more dream. Because there's more people to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, God has a dream for his church. You can find his dream for his church in Ephesians 5 and verse 27. God wants his church to be a glorious church. That word glorious means splendid, noble, gorgeous, honorable. That's the kind of church God wants. God wants his church not having spot. That means he wants it clean and he wants it pure. He wants his church not having wrinkles. He don't want problems within the ministry of the church. And he said he wants his church to be holy and without blemish. And in order for any church to realize its dream and become what God wants their church to be, you must incorporate some things within your church in order for it to happen happen and you may have already incorporated these things I don't know because I don't know your church but I know one thing if Trinity Baptist Church or any other church if they ever really become what God wants a church to become and receive the blessings of God and have growth and see people saved and see people baptized and see God do something in their midst that only God can do, then there has to be some things incorporated into that church in order for it to happen. I've got several, but I'm only going to give you two this morning. First of all, you must incorporate into your church the realization of why God started the church back in Acts chapter 2. You've got to take a look at the church in Acts chapter 2. And I know that we live in a different time, a different era, but I want to tell you something. There's some principles about that church that ought to be found in every church around the world. You must realize that God designed a church to be his tool to win a lost world to Jesus Christ. That's why God started the church. You'd never know it when you go into the average church nowadays, but that's why Jesus started the church. Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the church was started to get the gospel around the world and get people saved. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 why Jesus came into this world. It's very plain. It's very simple. The Bible said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus left heaven's glory. Jesus came to Bethlehem and was born as a babe. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus died a horrible death. Jesus went to hell and paid the penalty for mankind's sin. And then after three days and three nights in the grave, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. But hey, folks, he did it all for one reason. And that is so people could be saved. That ought to be the main purpose of every church. That ought to be the main reason for every church. You see, all the preaching that takes place here at Trinity Baptist Church or any other church, all the teaching, all the singing, all the work that takes place in a church should evolve around the purpose of the church, the main purpose of the church, and that is carrying out the Great Commission. Going out into the highways and hedges, compelling them to come in. Going out and witnessing and winning people to Christ. Giving invitations so that people have an opportunity to be saved after the gospel is given out. And then once those people get saved and baptized, then you teach them 
what God said a church is supposed to do, and that is for them to do what the others did when they reached them. Teaching others also. You see, the last words Jesus spoke here on this earth are recorded in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. Before he ascended into heaven, he said this, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The very last words Jesus spoke was part of the Great Commission. Now fast forward. Fifty days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, on the day of Pentecost, the power of the Holy Ghost did come upon them just as Jesus said it would. Now remember what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, when the power of the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you shall be witnesses. Well, in Acts chapter 2, the power of the Holy Ghost came. What's the very next thing you read? I find Simon Peter up preaching. And he's preaching there to thousands of people. They speak different languages, but every man heard that in their own tongue. When he finished preaching... After preaching about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he told about how Jesus' soul went to hell for three days and three nights, and after he finished preaching, he gave an invitation, and 3,000 people were saved. And the Bible said those that were saved were gladly to be baptized. Brother, if you've been saved and you haven't been baptized, there's something wrong with your salvation experience. You've been born again, you've asked Jesus to come in your heart and be your Savior, then hey, you ought to want to be baptized. That's another sermon. But what I'm saying this morning is this. When the people in the church do what God says do, when the Holy Ghost comes upon them, the result will be people will get saved and the church will grow and people will get baptized. You know, in, in 2018, there were 46,034 churches, don't miss this, in the Southern Baptist Convention just last year. About 10,000, almost a fourth, of 46,034 churches didn't baptize one convert. Hey, statistics don't lie. Another 10,000 only baptized one. One convert. I think that's sad. When the main purpose of the church is to get the gospel out in our communities, in the surrounding areas, and around the world, preach the gospel to every creature, do everything we can to get people saved and baptized and teach them to win the world, and yet 10,000 Baptist churches in 2018 never baptized one. Why are they there? Huh? What's the use? Can you imagine the money it takes to keep 10,000 churches going? There's salaries. There's electricity. There's building maintenance. And not one did what Jesus said the church is supposed to do. That's amazing to me. Not one baptism in 10,000 churches. I submit to you, they have no vision. They have no dream for their ministry. Another thing churches must do to have their dream for their church come true is they must have unity. 
Number one, they got to make the main purpose of the church the main purpose. And number two, when they do, they must have unity. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, a question is asked, can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer to that question, of course, is no, they cannot. And no church will ever realize their dream church if the leaders of the church and the people of the church are not unified in purpose of the church. You can still exist. You can still have services. You can still sing the songs. You can still listen to the beautiful solos. Still play in the orchestra. Go through all the motions of what a church should be. And yet, if you don't have unity, you're never going to realize your dream. It's just impossible. You study in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 about the first church, and you'll find out that they had all things in common. They were all in one accord. What was the result? People were getting saved every day, getting baptized every day, and the church grew every day. They kept the main purpose the main purpose. And they had unity while they were doing it. You see, no church has ever been destroyed from without. None. I can promise you, I don't know much about you, but if somebody were to come and try to destroy Trinity Baptist Church, I believe Trinity Baptist Church would rise up with a force and say you're not going to do it if they came from without. But many churches have been destroyed from within. As a matter of fact, that very first church that we see that was started in Acts chapter 1 and 2 and 3, when we look at that church, boy, it's on fire for God. Started out, 3,000 people were saved. The Lord added to the church daily. People were being saved by the multitudes, baptized by the multitudes. Man, they were on fire for God. You know what? That church don't even exist anymore. And hasn't for years and years and years and years. I thought about that one day and I said, I'm going to find out why. I'm going to search the scriptures. I am going to find out what happened to probably the greatest church that there's ever been on the face of this earth to cause its demise. So I started reading through the book of Acts. I read chapter 3, didn't see it. Read chapter 4, chapter 5, didn't see it. And then I got to chapter 6. And I wrote, read verse number 1. And the Bible says, there arose a murmuring. Ooh. They had no murmuring back when everybody was together. But now they have a murmuring in their church. And you know, murmuring is like gossip. Murmuring is, I don't like what's going on in my church. Murmuring is, well, I don't think they ought to do that. That's murmuring. And I promise you, if it destroyed the greatest church that's ever been on the face of this earth, it will destroy any church if it's not dealt with. I know very little about your church as I've said I do know the times that my wife and I visit here you folks have been very very friendly to us many have shook our hands greeted us I know the choir and the music is the kind of music that lifts up Christ I know you got a good spirit in your church but I do know this much about your church I know that your church is in the process of making probably the most important decision it can make in the near future. And that is who is going to be your next pastor. And I also know this much. I know that during this process of finding the man God wants you to call be your pastor, you better have unity. 
Did you hear what I said? You better have unity. And I don't know, maybe you have the best unity of any church in, in Iredale County. I, are, are we in Iredale County? I don't live in Iredale County. I live in Lincoln County. And you may have more unity than any church in Iredale County. I don't know. But I'm just saying you're about to make the most important decision that a church can make, and that is who are we going to call to be our leader, our shepherd, our senior pastor? Who's it going to be? You better have unity. Or you could make a big mistake in who that man is. You see, if there's any anger in the hearts of people between each other, if there's any unforgiveness, jealousy, strife between you and someone else in this church, you need to get over it. You need to let it go. You see, there's more at stake here than your feelings. This church is at stake. And every member. Some might say, well, you don't know what so-and-so did to me or said about me. You're right. I don't have a clue. But I do know what every one of us did to Christ. Christ. And if you've been born again, you've been saved. I know he forgave you. And he forgave me. I mean, look at Jesus. He's hanging on a cross. Blood is dripping from his hands and his feet where they drove nails in his hands and his feet. Blood is dripping down his face where they put the crown of thorns on his head, where they yanked out his beard. Blood is dripping from his back and his sides where they took the cat of nine tails and beat on him. They hit him in his face. He's hanging on a cross. People are walking by. Some are wagging their heads in disgust. Some are laughing and making fun of our Savior while he hangs on the cross. And while hanging there, the very first words that he says. He made seven sayings. But the first one was this. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I submit to you if Jesus Christ can forgive the crowd that crucified him, then we as Christians ought to be able to forgive anybody who's wronged us. You see, the most you or I will be like Christ is when we forgive somebody who wrongs us, who doesn't deserve our forgiveness. I want to close by saying this. I'm glad. I am so glad. And when my wife and I lived in a small house at 9218 Ponder Lane in Louisville, Kentucky with our new little baby just a couple of months old, I am so glad that there was a church just a couple of miles from us who had a vision. That church had a program to reach people that most churches have never even heard of. On Thursday nights, many men of that church would gather together and pray. And then they would go out and they would visit people. Not just to tell them, we're glad you came to church. Not just to tell them, I hope you come back. But to ask them if they could come into their house. And then they would sit down beside them. 
do a little small talk. And then they would take their New Testament out of their pocket and ask, do you mind if I share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you and how to be saved? It all started with the pastor of that church who invited one of the deacons to go with him. And it started. And when it started, it caught on fire. And we saw people walking down the aisle on Sunday mornings who had been saved in their home coming to make their professions of faith in Jesus Christ and then be baptized. The pastor of that great church is sitting here today. For the turban to stand up. Fifty years ago, he baptized me. By the way, he don't live too far from here, and he's looking for a church to attend. His sister-in-law already goes here. You better get you a preacher that preaches the gospel, because that's the only kind of church he's going to go to. Amen? Folks, I want to tell you something. It works. There's no limit to what God can do at Trinity Baptist Church. The future of Trinity Baptist Church is as beautiful and bright as the promises of God. But it always begins with a dream. What do you all talk about when you get in your meetings, the leadership? Do you talk about the mechanics of the church? Well, all outside, 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 outside. See, most churches focus within. God's looking for a church that's focused without. I know you've got to have them meetings. I know that. I pastored for a long time. I know you've got to have them. But I want to tell you something. Your main focus ought to be what's going on outside the church in the hearts and lives of people and getting the gospel to them. And God will say, there's a church right there, Trinity Baptist Church. And the Holy Ghost will fall on you. And I want to tell you something. People get saved like you've never seen get saved before. Things that happen like you've never seen happen before because God can only do the kind of things that we can dream about. Do you have a dream? Do you have a vision? If you don't, in God's dear name, I hope you'll get one. I pray that you get one. The souls of people around this church are at stake. The worth of just one soul, the Bible says, is worth more than the whole world. What's Trinity Baptist Church doing to reach them? That's what pleases God. Let's stand together if we could, please.